I've always loved making conversation with strangers. I love the spontaneity of the moment, the feeling of recognizing a piece of myself in someone else, of connecting through shared interests, values, or worries. I've also always been a positive person by nature, too. This is mostly due to, due to my mother and her way of raising me, as reassuring lines like, oh, honey, it's not the end of the world, or let's look at what does go well, were among my mother's classics when I was a kid. As I grew older and went to university, I started to read and hear about environmental problems. And I soon heard my mother's voice in my head. Let's look at what does go well. And it's probably not the end of the world. So I didn't worry too much. I put my faith in people in power and the experts who were working very hard to fix this thing called climate change. And I tried to remain optimistic, along with many others of my generation. My mother will be seeing this talk soon, and I don't want to guilt trip her too much. The point is that my mother was a woman of her time. As I was raised in the 90s, a decade that we now consider a crucial one in our efforts towards global sustainability. Although our knowledge of environmental problems was already well established, and environmental politics will wear, will wear on the way, it was also a time of huge technological faith, of belief in human ingenuity, and of a strong, strong sense of progress, of prosperity and advancement. One word to capture the spirit of this time would be growthism. So growthism is this cognitive as well as institutionalized frame in which economic growth is conceived as something good, necessary and desirable. In almost all societies today, it defines our shared norms, values and beliefs but also economic reasoning, institutions, and political decision-making. As such, growthism is the glue that holds our economy together, our capitalist economy. Without it, capitalism not only loses its spell, it also fails to deliver on its promises. It falls into crisis. Over the past decades, growthism has become all the more pervasive, and capitalist economies have continued to expand. Scientists have started to talk about a great acceleration when referring to the ecological impact or accelerating consumption and production patterns has started to have. As a result, we are on the verge of a climate catastrophe and ecosystem collapse. Species are becoming extinct at a dazzling rate, and millions of people living in the poorest parts of this world are already forced to flee their homes. The future doesn't look so optimistic anymore. Even my mother says that now. Today, I would like to take you with me on abolishing growthism and imagining a different future that is not capitalist. In other words, a post-capitalist future. A future in which we have an economy that is organized around human and planetary well-being instead of capital accumulation. In short, an economy that puts justice, care and sustainability at its very heart. So, let's start with doing some myth-busting and going to the heart of the growthist ideology. First, our ecological crisis isn't caused by humankind, or us humans. And it's certainly not caused because of human population growing. It is caused by designing our economies in a particular kind of way, so they've become organized around and dependent upon ever-rising levels of economic growth. This is what we know as capitalism. As capitalist economies are biggest, or most advanced, 
in the richest countries, it is rich countries that bear the biggest responsibility for our ecological crisis. The 10% richest part of this world is responsible for almost half of car global carbon emissions. Meanwhile, those who are hit hardest by the climate crisis played virtually no role in creating this. This is unjust, unacceptable, and a political choice. Second, green growth, or green capitalism, is a fairy tale, unfortunately. It is told by people in power and corporations to uphold the status quo and pretend that things are going in the, wrong, in the right direction. What they say is that we could decouple economic growth from environmental pressures like emissions and material use by massively investing in innovation and, and smart green technologies. But this has no scientific grounding. Instead, what is happening is that capitalism's built-in growth, built-in need for growth, ramps up our energy and resource demand so fast that it erases any improvements made in terms of efficiency, for example. This is why we remain stuck in an energy expansion instead of seeing an energy transition. And third, growth is not a synonym for progress. We know that more economic growth in rich countries isn't needed to improve people's lives, nor is it needed to meet global development goals like, like eradicating extreme poverty. Over the past decades, economic growth has benefited only a few, that is, the richest 10%. We have seen inequality rising, but within and across countries, across countries. Sorry. Now, this tells us that the struggle for social justice and ecological stability are both part of the same transformation path, the transformation to a post-growth, post-capitalist future. So, what would such a transformation look like? It would mean that rich countries would abandon growth as a societal objective and instead reduce energy and resource use, organize their economies around provisioning for human needs and reducing inequality. This is known as degrowth. Instead of assuming that all of these sectors in our economy should continue to grow indefinitely, regardless of whether we need them or not, we can scale down less necessary and ecologically destructive industries. Think of fast fashion, industrial beef, commercial aviation, private jets. Meanwhile, of course, we can ban their ads that only ramp up unnecessary consumption. We can, theref we can next, we can um, improve access to things that we clearly do need. Things like decent housing, nutritious food, high quality education and healthcare. We can um, reverse privatization and expand public and cooperative forms of provisioning. Everyone should have access to the things they need to live well, regardless of whether the economy is growing or not. As we do so, and we focus our economy more on provisioning instead of production, GDP, economic growth, might go down. Now, in a growth-dependent capitalist economy, this is a problem. People would lose their jobs, businesses would go bankrupt, it is a social catastrophe. But we can think of more innovative, new ways of organizing social security and make it independent from growth. We can shorten the work week implement a job guarantee tied to a living wage to ensure everyone of a guaranteed livelihood. And lastly, we can distribute income and wealth more fairly. We can implement maximum income ratios, we can cap individual wealth, and we can implement progressive taxation schemes. 
we can democratize workplaces to ensure that economic value is shared amongst those who created instead of siphoned off to shareholders. We know from extensive research that by making such steps, we can actually meet the needs of all of humanity at a high standard with up to 60% less energy than we presently use. It would bring our economy back into balance with the living world. Now, clearly, doing so entails a profound change in our societies. Indeed, it would change the world as we know it. So what does this all mean for you today? Should you all become activists? Well, yes, please. <laughs> you know, there's this thing with the word activist that I don't really like. The same goes for the word wereldverbeterer or world improver. As don't we all want to secure a livable future for our children and grandchildren, or for that matter, for all forms of life? So aren't we all activists? Surely, none of us wanted to become a world destroyer when we were young. When it comes down to activism and world changing, there are a few things I want to leave you with. Crucially, activism is not something you do alone. Sticking to individual behavior change is not only mentally draining, it is also insufficient if we are to change societal structures. Systemic change has always been a result of people getting together, of joining forces, building movements, in short, of collective rather than individual action. This means that we'll, start, we'll have to see ourselves not only as consumers, but as citizens, political agents, decision makers. It means that we'll have to talk to each other, or friends, or neighbors, or colleagues, to disentangle how growthism has its grip over our minds, and to collectively imagine what our streets, or workplaces, or cities could look like if they weren't capitalist. It means spending time in places that already exist today in our growthist societies, where non-growth logics prevail, like energy and food co-ops. To new learn new habits and unlearn old ones. And above all, it entails that we support and join bottom-up social movements to increase political pressure from below against powerful interests at the top. We should all decide for ourselves what kind of activism works for us and what kind of labels we want to use. Surely, doing so can change your daily life or even your personality quite a lot. If I look at myself, now I've start, started calling myself an activist, I've noticed that meeting new people is not always so nice anymore, as already in the first moments of introduction, I find myself talking about politics. Also, remaining faithful to my natural spirit for positivity and listening to my mother's voice in my head saying it's not the end of the world somehow doesn't work so well anymore when digging through IPCC reports that actually portray the end of the world. But activism has also brought me so much. It has allowed me to be surrounded by people who understand the magnitude of the challenges that define our generation, yet who aren't turning away from them. If anything, this has made me convinced that another world is not only possible, but already in the making. Now, it is up to us all to ensure that she will find her way. Thank you.